Yeah, that it takes up an even larger chunk of the screen now. All right. All right, so went through quizzes and Rigby, yours was not strictly speaking related to OCAM, but it's a good question um, because this is something I've heard about before. What's called the uh, relativistic effects. Okay. <laughs> All right. There we go. That'll do. Yeah, relativistic effects um, is basically the, the idea that when you get to large enough nuclei, they pull in the electrons tight enough. Um, in the lowest energy levels in the 1s and the 2s orbitals um, that that they wind up in order to, to meet the requirements of um, a Heisenberg uncertainty principle they wind up moving fast enough that you have um, relativity winds up playing a role in how they behave um, and which is interesting on a couple levels. One, it's kind of cool to see quantum interacting with relativity, which we usually associate with really, really large scales, not really, really small scales. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about it is, and I, this is something that shows up in computational chemistry because you have to change your calculations if you're using heavy metals, but I don't know that much about it because I always worked in organic in grad school. Um, so it's been known for a while, but, and I did not read the paper entirely, but one of the most interesting things about this is that, that if relativity is playing a role, that means that the electrons are moving fast enough, they're moving close enough to the speed of light, which you have to take relativity into account. That implies the electrons are moving more closely, like similar to the Bohr model, not, not the way we think about electrons as being clouds of probability. Um, so that's probably partly because electrons are both particles and waves simultaneously, right? But it's like, you know, they move like it's an actual particle when we're talking about observing some of these properties. I, I don't, I did not see hard evidence in terms of like a real smoking gun showing they, they used idea of relativity in this paper to explain several, um, several properties of gold versus silver, why gold behaves differently than silver. Um, but it was pretty theory based and not as hard on the empirical measurable evidence um, from the brief skim that I went through there. So it's possible that it's not actually relativity, that relativity is approximating something else. Um, but either way, it's really interesting and it's sort of at the forefront of some, some research that's happening right now. Um, that's, you know, for the last 10 or 20 years, there's not been a whole lot of consensus on it. So it's fascinating. Um, but I don't, I'm not sure that we know a whole lot about being able to show um, how that affects interactions with heavy metal poisoning or anything like that. Um, I think all that that paper really tied it to was um, the oxidation potential and ionization energy really. So um, fascinating, but I don't know enough to go beyond that. All right. Um, and um, Miranda asked about smell, why some things smell longer than others. That's actually a pretty quick question. If you can smell it, it means that there's pieces of it in the air. Um, and so anything you can smell will eventually not smell unless something is replacing those particles as they evaporate or sublimate from whatever is, is the source of that smell. Um, so the, but on the other set, on the other hand, there are certain molecules that our nodes and our taste buds are really, really, really sensitive to in terms of it really does not take many molecules you know, we're in the parts per billion molecule range where you're you're you can still easily smell them or taste them and sometimes it goes beyond that it was the bioacetone that you might must have been in the parts per trillion and still detectable 
Um, so it's, you know, some things that smell more strongly than others, it can be just because your nose is more sensitive to that shape of a molecule. Um, and sometimes it's just that it has a higher concentration. Both of those things play into how intense a smell is. And then last but not least, I'm going to leave you with a little bit of a, uh, a teaser for next quarter. Um, we haven't talked much about different isotopes of carbon. Different isotopes of carbon don't really affect any electronic properties. And electronic properties are the properties that we actually care about in OCHEM, right? Everything in OCHEM has to do with, with electrons and stereo and um, uh, electromagnetic force. And isotopes don't really affect that. Um, however, we can measure different isotopes because remember from talking about NMR, anything NMR can be used any, with anything that has an odd number of nucleons. Meaning anytime you've got an odd number of particles in the nucleus. So carbon-12 and carbon-14 can't be detected with NMR, but carbon-13 can. And carbon-13 is stable. It's not radioactive. So we'll, use, we'll talk about carbon NMR and how, how we can use that to figure out or to understand um, chemical structures similar to the way we use proton NMR. Um, but it doesn't generally change chemical properties. What can is if you have a carbon-14 atom that is radioactive, when it decays, it turns to a nitrogen atom, to a nitrogen-14, which is the stable isotope of nitrogen. And now, now all of a sudden that does have effects on the on the chemical structure because maybe where you had a benzene ring, now you have pyrrolidine. Pyrrolidine? Is that the one benzene with the, the carbon replaced with the nitrogen? Purine, thank you. Um, pyrrolidine, I think, is five-sided ring with the carbon replacing nitrogen or nitrogen replacing carbon. So isotopes don't do play a role. And radioactivity does play a role in that it can change the number of protons you have, which changes the charge of the molecule. But we think about it mostly in context of carbon-13 is the most useful um, isotope to consider when it comes to um, when it comes to OCHEM. All right, let's do some practice with Diels Alder reactions. Well, you guys work on that. I'm going to run across the halls and uh, switch the room number so that anybody who's coming late to me will find us. Get when we do this reaction. Yeah, so the it's going to look like All three of those moving at the same time, so wind up with cyclohexene is the base molecule. This is the simplest Diels-Alder reaction we can have. Gives us a cyclohexene 
then we wind up with the two cyano groups. Attached cis relative to each other. If it was cis, would not be the enantiomer, that'd be a diastereomer. The enantiomer would be switching this one to down and this one to up. Still cis, but the mirror image of this molecule. This is trans, yeah. Sorry, so still trans is what I meant. But with both each of these stereo centers flipped. Right, and that gives us a little too sensitive. Oh, we'll clear it off in a second. Eh? All right. Generally speaking, let's see if this was. Yeah, I I switched the order. Now I want to switch it back. We'll do this one first. More practice, it feels older. All right. If you start with it with your substituents cis, you wind up with the cis product. You start with them trans, you get the trans product. So for A, we're going to wind up with get this compound and its mirror image. Actually, this one doesn't have an enantiomer, right? Because it's got an internal mirror plane. So it's a meso compound. We get the same thing here except with carboxylic acid instead of an ester. So it doesn't matter whether we draw them up or down as long as they're cis on the ring structure. Right? Because they either come from this dienophile either comes from behind the board towards the um, butadiene or from in front of the board towards the butadiene. And either way, if it starts out cis on the dienophile, you're going to wind up with the product being cis. And conversely, if it starts out trans, you wind up with the trans product, which probably has an enantiomer. So for C, you still wind up with cyclohexene. So the diketo cyclohexene. Molecule and the most important thing with this is that we draw these two substituents as being trans on the ring structure. Mm -hmm. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about reactivity because it turns out that only one conformer of butadiene can interact. Right, so remember that S6 looked like this, and this was S trans. If we're going to have the two carbons on the outside interacting with the same dienophile, then they have to be pointed the same direction spatially. If all of this is happening at the same time, then our diene has to be in this shape or it doesn't work. Right? So you can have conjugated dienes that actually won't go through a Diels Alder reaction. Which one of these fits that bill? Which one of these will not go through a Diels Alder reaction? Which one can't get to the S6? Six members. Yeah, this one's locked into the S trans position, right? There's no way it can rotate without breaking this ring structure. So this one is going to be the least reactive, and it's least reactive to the point of non-reaction. Which one's going to be the most reactive? Oh, uh, oh we kind of talked about the flexibility of the, the I have to say the bilateral. Yeah, this one's in an equilibrium reaction, right? Between S cis versus S trans. And S trans is actually favored by, by delta, delta G because it allows us to point these two groups in opposite directions. So sterically, the S trans is more stable. The S cis will exist in some amount, some ratio at room temperature, but more of it's gonna be as S trans. So if we have a molecule that's locked into the S, cis confirmation that's going to be more reactive just based on statistics and probability right if you have a mixture of these two and you have a dienophile if they happen to bump into the dienophile there's a better than 50 percent chance that your butadiene is in this configuration which means there's a better than 50 percent chance this molecule can't react Versus over here, if this bumps into a dienophile, it reacts because it's stuck into the reactive form. All right, so one three butadiene works to go through the Alder reaction, but cyclopentadiene is more reactive. Cyclopentadiene is our sort of our gold standard for feels all the reactions because it reacts so quickly and easily. However, that changes things a little bit. Whoa. So cyclopentadiene will actually react with itself to go through a deal of all the reaction. What do you get? What's the structure of what you get when you let cyclopentadiene react with itself? Let it react, like we could stop it.
still three arrows, right? Three pairs of electrons moving in a circle. So we're still going to make, we still have four carbons reacting here with two carbons here. So we're still gonna make a six-sided ring. We're still gonna make cyclohexene, but with a bunch of other stuff happening too, right? So cyclohexene that we make, I'm gonna draw as, as red. So it's going to be confusing enough so we can try and keep it clean. All right, but if these are the red one, the red carbons, that's these ones, right? Which means they're still linked in the middle as well. Yep. I'm not sure if this will actually get captured on the recording. It's not a promising noise it just made. So reorient. So we're going to wind up with a bicyclic structure where they're connected across the middle by this carbon right here. And then we have the rest of this is still attached, but these two carbons, actually, those two carbons are still attached to the rest of that ring structure, right? So we still have one, two, three, four. That attached as well. So it's actually a, we wouldn't really call it a tricyclic structure because these two rings are fused, they're sort of in the same plane. Bicyclic would be two rings that are attached in, in a more fused way, I guess, typically. It's not, I mean, you're not technically wrong if you call this tricyclic. Um, but it's not tricyclic the way that a bicyclic structure is bicyclic, if that makes any sense whatsoever. All right, so the trick with this is that this bicyclic structure has two different ways you can arrange the rest of that ring structure. We have that shape. We have the version with the ring structure pointing up towards us. And this is when it gets more helpful to draw it the other way. Right, remember when we first started talking about these bicyclic structures, there was a way to draw it that shows that more like you're looking at the front of the boat with the boat configuration, where the base molecule look like that. Each of these carbons has a position that goes 
up in the position it goes down. And so that means that we have to Um, I guess it means we annotate. I know how to use that one. So that means that we have, have to be careful with this. Because what would we don't know whether we would expect to see. That structure or the one that points this up, kind of more planar looking. Oops, um, that's not where the double one goes. Right, so things get really complicated looking very quickly. We just started with two pentagons. We've been doing pentagons for, for six months now. Turns out when you take two pentagons and you connect to connect them, we get all sorts of funky geometries happening. And we can expect that the two versions here are not going to be the same in energy, right? If, if for no other reason than just based on sterics. This is a complicated enough looking molecule, we can expect that there's going to be some sort of weird interaction happening. All right, so Anytime you have cyclopentadiene reacting with a substituted dienophile, you said there was a way to stop it from reacting with itself. How do you do that? You can't really. You just rely on the fact that it's an equilibrium reaction. Oh, okay. um, so if you have cyclopentadiene, you have some of the dimerization product, some of the dimer presence. You just have to you know, rely on the fact that the other form will also be there. All right, so the way we, we discuss these two possible positions, and so we're going to make it simple, we're going to simplify the, the structure for a second, get rid of the whole second frame and just look at um, a substituted dienophile that's a little simpler. Um, the two positions that we can have with these bicyclic structures. Are endo and exo. Right, so the in the way we define that, the, the way that I was kind of, I mean, endo and exo usually mean in and out, right? And then in this case, they're referring to the larger side of the ring that they're attached to. And so if we look at this part, that's a five sided ring that I circled there, right? Versus, that's a six sided ring because I circled in blue. So endo and exo are always going to be relative to the larger of the two rings in a bicyclic structure, which would be the ones I circled in blue here. And so endo means inward. So endo means that these two substituted are substituents are pointed more towards the larger side of the ring. So
those are sort of pointed in generally speaking the same direction. So that's the endo position. So the exo position is when your substituent is pointed in the exact opposite direction as the larger side of the ring. And we have to be careful there because it's always, you always have that that called relative to the larger side of the ring, right? Because if it's endo towards the larger side of the ring, that means by definition it's exo relative to the, large, the small side of the ring, right? They're both sort of 50 50. And you, but you can kind of see when you draw it, these ones are drawn 180 degrees from each other. That and that bond are parallel. They're not really in three dimensions, but they're close to parallel, pointed in opposite directions. That's what makes it exo. These ones, it's kind of hard to see that it's actually that it's pointed inward, but it's not opposite. Right, so just like with axial versus equatorial, it wasn't always easy to see which ones were equatorial, equatorial, but you could always tell which ones were axial, right? Because they had to be straight up and down. Same idea here. Exo is always going to be easy to see that they're opposite to each other. Endo is going to be the other option. And when we see these, when we expect exo or endo to be most likely, which one's going to be the favorite product? Comes down to one of three factors, right? Resonance, electronegativity, or sterics. So, sterics would say endo. It's pointed kind of away from everything else. Although, if if exo is relative to the larger bridge, these are sort of pointed towards the, the single carbon here. These are pointed the opposite of the single carbon. And more towards the larger side. So, based on sterics, exo might make more sense. I'm talking you into the wrong option because it is actually endo, but it's not because of sterics. The sterics predict that we would see. I guess we're getting these out of order. It's really messing with me. Um, we, we would expect to see the endo versus exo. We would expect to see exo based on steric, but we actually observe endo being favored. And it has to do with electronic with orbital overlap. So more resonance. So because this pericyclic reaction relied on us getting orbitals overlapping with each other in the transition state, right? So Getting this orbital to overlap with this orbital and this one to overlap here in order to get this reaction to happen in the first place. We can do that in both, both of these forms, the endo and the exo. However, if you if you do it with your substituted dienophile in the endo position, the pi bonds here can interact with these pi bonds. The pi bond is still there. So you actually get more over orbital overlap if you put your substituted diene, sorry, dienophile into the endo position. So this is a case of kinetic versus thermodynamic, right? Thermodynamically, because of sterics, we would expect exo to be more stable. But because this transition state 
is more favorable because of the orbital overlap, the, the transition state is lower for the endo product. But your overall change in energy means the exo product is favored thermodynamically at equilibrium. Right? And so our textbook, this is one of the few places where our textbook really doesn't do a great job of explaining things. Um, I haven't had to pull in on the lot of outsourced outside resources for figures because I really like our textbook, but it does not explain this well. It says some of those words, but it doesn't have a figure like this that shows the orbital overlap. And it just basically says endo is favored due to orbital overlap and moves on. This is a complicated figure. It's hard to wrap your head around, but we're going to keep talking about orbitals for our next series of reactions. And so we need to start thinking this way. Um, so this is from a website called Mastering Organic Chemistry, which is a good secondary resource to have in your back pocket anyway. They, they make not quite as fancy looking figures, but they have a lot of figures to focus on um, basically any, it goes more in depth to anything we've talked about. So if you wanted more information about elimination reactions and the factors for favoring elimination reactions, it's a really good resource for just anything about OCHEM that you want more um, information about or just another way. He has good videos. Um, it was just a, uh, it's a little bit like Khan Academy. It was a OCHEM grad student who um, lost funding or didn't get accepted to a postdoc or something like that and couldn't get a full-time teaching job. So he started making these figures on the side for him teaching as an adjunct and then realized that they actually wound up being his primary source of income maintaining this website. So um, really good stuff, really helpful, especially because in my, in my opinion, he understands orbitals better than than most of the textbooks out there. The other the textbook textbooks might understand them, but they don't explain them well enough for me. All right, so the, the bullet point here is that. That's the one that was out of order. The secondary orbital overlap interactions favor the endo transition state. And so uh, kind of an important point about these dienophiles is substituted dienophiles only really work if it's an electron withdrawing group attached to the dienophile. So which means basically you have to have your your carbon carbon double bond, but whatever is attached to your carbon carbon double bond can't just be an alkyl group. It has to have, it's going to be something with a conjugated high bond, most frequently a carbonyl. So this acts as an electron withdrawing group, which pulls electron density away from the, from the reactive pi bond. It makes it more reactive. If you put it just a methyl group here and here, that's going to slow the reaction down. And Gill's all the reactions are already not that fast of reactions. So it's really, you can, you can essentially um, stop a Gill's all the reaction by just making your dienophile have more electron density. And all of a sudden it doesn't have enough orbital overlap. It can't get close enough to the diene to react. So when we have a substituted dienophile, it's always going to have these pi bonds here on top and bottom which means in those pi bonds are always going to want to make these secondary orbital overlaps. In other words, these guys here need to be pointed towards the diene. Basically, they're going to stack up underneath the diene. So that you get something like the 
So that's our Dyna file, and it's re reacting with. I'm going to draw on top of these with different colors, so it's going to look a little confusing. So remember that the blue Dyna file has to come either from behind or in front for these orbitals to form, right? So by lining it up in the endo position, you allow how did I even do that? I'm gonna start doing that. You allow the pi orbitals here to overlap with the pi orbitals that are gonna form here. And these pi orbitals. Overlap here. Right, so you're always going to make the endo transition state if it's a substituted diana file. All right. So let's practice with this, practicing drawing endo and exo. Just remember if it's if it's trans, your Diana file is trans, by definition, one of them is going to be endo and the other one's exo, right? And if they're the same, you can't really tell the difference between the two sides. So it doesn't really matter. You're going to get the trans product anyway, where it's still bicyclic. But one of those cyano groups is going to be endo and the other one's going to be exo. This matters most when we either only have a single substitution or when it's cis. And those are the ones that's going to end up being endo. So try drawing some of these products. And then we'll take a break in a few minutes. Go through the top three and then we'll go through the bottom three um, when we come back on break. I mean, certainly, that certainly seems like it would make sense, right? That if electron donating versus withdrawing is going to affect things on the Diana file, probably in the opposite direction we would expect. If we want the Diana file to be losing electron density to make it more reactive, we probably want the Diana to have extra electron density to make it more reactive. Um, but it turns out more that it might be, it matters more that it's stuck in the SIS um, is has a larger effect on the diene file reactive or sorry on the diene reactivity than whether or not you have electron donating groups. But yeah, we don't have nearly as as many restrictions on the diene itself. It just needs to be able to get to S cis. I don't have numbers off the top of my head, but I would almost guarantee that you'll see something. I think I should use both of those things. Oh, they're right there. Um, 
is going to have some effect. If we went into measured rates, we would see some difference for sure. So there's our basic five cyclic structure that we're making. We're adding, we have two cyano groups attached to the right hand side, and they're going to be endo relative to the rest of the, to the larger side of the ring. So we're going to preferentially make this stereoisomer over the exo. You probably get some of the exo product, um, but, and I don't have off the top of my head, I don't have numbers for what that, the difference in transition state energy is, but it's favored by a pretty strong margin. Um, those secondary orbital effects wind up being not quite resonance, but really close to the resonance. And that winds up playing a large role here. So for B, our five-sided ring looks a little bit different in that it's got an oxygen, not a carbon, but that's the only real difference there, right? It's still going to behave in the same way. And we have a trans product or a trans dying file, which means we're going to get one exo and one endo and the enantiomer. Having one exo and one endo means all of a sudden we don't have a meso plane. Here, we have a line of plane right down the middle where it's symmetric, right? So it's a meso compound. If you have one exo and one endo, you don't have that internal mirror plane anymore. So you would have also make the version with one up and one down. Which it's harder to draw this this position right here. It's a lot easier to draw the exo than the endo. We're going to wind up if we draw this one endo, then we're going to wind up drawing. Kind of have to go the other way. If that one's endo. You, know, you almost have to elongate the bonds to make it clear that one's on top of the other. Those would be the two. Oh, and I, I messed up this would be the oxygen, not a, not a carbon. Oh. And so, not so bad once we know what's going on, right? Deals all the reactions have a lot of moving pieces, but at the same time, they're pretty limited. You have to have a diene, you have to have a dienophile. And they're always going to make either cyclohexene or a substituted cyclohexene or these weird bicyclic structures, which still have cyclohexene as part of them. They just have other stuff as well. Right? So it, they should feel like you're doing the same thing every time once you've done it a few times. If we only have one substitution, that substituent has to be endo for our major product. So that just means that there's our bicyclic structure we made. In the endo position, we have that carbonyl group. And really, it would probably be rotated the other way again to maintain the maximize those orbital overlaps, having the carbonyl pointed this way would even be better for having those orbital overlaps. The other option would be if it was on the back carbon, right? 
which would just be the mirror image of this molecule, but it can be easier to draw it since we already got this drawn and have our frame of reference set. It can be easier to just redraw it. Like that. These two are mirror images of each other. It's just hard to visualize how exactly. I guess not. If you think about this molecule as being in front of the board and the board is the mirror, then that's the version that would show up in the mirror. And again, it wouldn't be wrong given what we've been working on or the way we've been doing it to just say plus EN for one of them. Um, but if you're not sure if it's an enantiomer, if you look at these two and you can't tell whether if they're enantiomers or not, but you know you're going to make both of them, just draw both of them like this. And then it doesn't matter if it's really a diastereum or a person in an enantiomer. It just takes a little bit more time to draw. Probably less time to draw than it does to figure out whether it's an enantiomer or not. All right, we'll come back and we'll do. Um, B, e, E, and F when we come back, and then we're going to talk about electrocyclic reactions and woodward hoffman rules, which are really cool and also really confusing. It's true. There's a, we'll come back at, at 10 after. Um, there's this, there was this guy who was in my um, research group in grad school who was a really fascinating guy. He spent his 20s, um, he got a computer science finance double, double major his first time through college um, and went to work for Citibank. He wound up, when he was like 23, he found an inefficiency in their code for their trading that they do on Wall Street and was able to optimize their code to save them like, you know, just fractions of a second on every trade which meant that he made them literally billions of dollars a year um, by making one little tweak to their code because Wall Street's all about microtransactions, right? Buy over here, sell over here for a tenth of a penny higher, but if you do it in bulk in enough times in a day, that winds up being a lot of money. And so it's all a race to see who has the best internet connection and who has the best code um, at the highest levels of Wall Street. And so he gave Citibank an edge and got made a VP really, really young, and then realized he really didn't like being in the finance world. He got made a VP and he didn't get to play with code anymore. And uh, so he went back to school for chemical physics, but he's the guy that knew like everything about everything. And so he was like, oh, relativistic effects. So of course I'm taking those into account in my calculations. <laughs> oh, Woodward Hoffman rules. You, didn't, you guys didn't work Woodward Hoffman rules? What's wrong with your school? Yeah, he was that guy. I knew everything about everything. Yeah, beautiful night. I don't know if I can get my brain to function like that. <laughs>
This is the hiding spot. What? Oh my goodness! <laughs> you really just stood back there so long enough. Oh, I never knew that. <laughs> it's actually they were like, huh? But that's what you presented right there. <laughs> that's uh, actually, I'm not sure if they're still in there. That was Katha Goralski and uh, Sarah Pierce's office last in the fall, anyway. They're still there. Katha is uh, Ryan's wife. She teaches Spanish here. Looks pretty much the same as you're grinding it in more. That's what makes 
Oh, that's cool. So I saw a video that was about Yin and Blue, and I saw them like preparing it, you know, mixing it up. And I was like, wow, there is a video about people making ultramarine. Like, I just like totally thought it was just the. Not many. What? There's not many. So you're one of a few. There, there actually, there's only the one. The oh, one nice. Okay. I thought I saw people make ultramarine, and it turned out they were making Yin and Blue. Oh, okay. Because the stuff you mix together looks the same. It's funny, it's you know, you can find communities to do everything on, on the internet, but it doesn't take you long going down. Like, if you take like three steps down from the, what people might consider mainstream, you wind up in areas where very few people are actually interested or looking at that. Yeah. It seems like it's not all that far related from stuff that you know might have a hundred thousand hits on that on YouTube or something like that. Um, but the one those extra two steps, and all of a sudden you lose like 90% of the people each step, and now all of a sudden you've got like 20 people in the world are actually looking at this. It's kind of how research works. Nobody in research actually looks at anything that anybody else is researching other than to cite it and inform their own research. And so you write a paper, you might have 20 people see your paper. And if you're lucky, half of them cite it. Yeah, because you want people to cite your paper, right? That means it's useful. Right. And that's that's basically the only thing you get out of publishing a paper. Um, that's the way that you show that there are basically two metrics for publishing a paper that determine if it's a um, what they call an impactful paper. What journal would you publish it in? Because bigger journals have a bigger readership. And how many people cite it? That's like the primary thing that you use to advocate for getting tenure or a tenure track job um, if you want to work in academia on the research side. It's basically the, the phrase that gets used all the time is publish or perish. If you don't publish in large enough journals with enough people citing you, then you don't get tenure and you lose your job. Um, so it's a, it's a very high stress thing. You're not compensated for those papers beyond the fact that you get to keep your job. The journals charge people to see your papers, but they don't pass any of that to the researcher, which is why they just email a researcher. They're happy to send you a copy of their article for free because there's a chance you might cite it, and that matters more to them than if you click through a page nature for it. It's a very weird world, and I think. It's going to change a lot in the next 20 years. I have no idea what it's going to look like. <laughs> Hoping to be in the middle of it, man. I have an off topic question that relates okay. back to uh, what the Miranda's quiz question was. Mm -hmm. um, since like set and pace are really related, um, and it's basically just uh, our way of like detecting chemicals, why do uh, we have like such different pace from? So a lot of that is cultural or learned. So essentially every human being is hardwired for a desire for three tastes, salty, sweet, and fatty. Sugar, fat, and salt were things that we needed in our diet early when we were hunter-gatherers um, that weren't very common. And so everybody likes those, because if you didn't like those, if you didn't gorge yourself on those when you found them, then you weren't likely to survive. But beyond that, everything else is an acquired taste, essentially. There's things that are more common than others to enjoy the taste of. But even things like vanilla, we like the, sm the smell and the taste of vanilla mostly because it's associated with um, fat and salt and sugar. You know, ice cream is the one that comes to mind the most, right? Ice cream and cookies, both high in fat, high in sugar. And so if you eat vanilla with fat and sugar enough times, your body associates that flavor with fat and sugar. And then all of a sudden that's an acquired taste. That's what an acquired taste is. It's basically training your brain to associate it with a, either a positive experience or a positive, or positive outcome in some other way. And so culturally that can be very different depending on what people in that particular part of the world eat. So, you know, seaweed, 
um, like nori on sushi. That's technically an acquired taste, but it is also salty, which hits one of those three flavors. But people from Japan are more likely to go eat, go eat seaweed snacks than people from Africa, just based on the fact that that's not a traditional ingredient in Africa. So it's those are the ones that are the and, and essentially, as far as I'm aware, everything is an acquired taste other than salt, fat, sugar. It's wild. It is. And it is, it's you're absolutely right. It's our, our body's way of basically measuring chemical structures and comparing them to each other. Not in the sense that we could draw it just after you taste it, unless you practice a lot, but in terms of like, okay, well, this is similar flavor to that because they have a similar chemical structure. I'm trying to think where I put that book. I have a book called Molecules and Taste Buds that makes really, really non-traditional comp flavor combinations based on molecular structure. Um, and it's really, really odd, like coffee crusted salmon. Usually you wouldn't think of those two flavors as going together. But if you look at traditional salmon preparations and what the molecules are that give it the taste, the desirable tastes, you can mimic those in a similar way with coffee. They're not the same molecules, but they're close enough that they still match together in interesting ways. Yeah, exactly. Well, some people eat like salmon for breakfast. There's some salmon dishes. I love salmon for breakfast. Lots of cold smoked salmon on that. With cream cheese on a bagel, yeah. onion bagel, or an egg everything bagel. They do a really good job with that at um, the place right over by Ross. Yeah, that doesn't one. sound that weird of a flavor combination because you have coffee with breakfast. Right, but the, the way that they get there is not by taking traditional cultural ingredients that went together. It's by take, starting from those and say, well, what has similar chemical structure to something over there? Let's try that combination. It is. There's some really interesting combinations in the book. Now, um, things you wouldn't necessarily suggest. Coffee and salmon is one of the tamer ones, actually. Um, I can't remember very many others off the top of my head. That's the one I've actually had before. What's that book called? I think it's called Taste Buds and Molecules. Or Molecules and Taste Buds. Anywho, let's get back to doing some of the all the reactions. So, reminder, we're looking for a diene file and the diene, and we're, when we put them together, it's going to make cyclohexene or a bicyclic structure. And on the diene side, we don't need to worry too much about endo versus exo because we're leaving a pi bond here, right? Which means these are not tetrahedral carbons. They're trigonal planar carbons still, right? Which means there is no exo, exo versus endo on the, the alkene side of this molecule. There's just trigonal planar. So these methoxy groups basically are just going to stay there, pointed out directly away from everything else. And then on the other side, we wind up making one endo versus one exo of these carboxylic acids. Plus the enantiomer. Where the one in front is exo and the one in back is endo.
be a diene, or sorry, the dienophile only has one substituent, the cyano group, and so that has to get put in the endo position towards the remaining pi bonds. Plus an inhibitor. This one would be plus EN as well. The enantiomer here would just look like diana group attached to the back carbon, but still in the endo position. Somebody about my height must have installed this because this is like just perfect height for me. It's a little too tall for your seat. Yeah. All right. So for F, let's do another tricyclic. Still got to be in the endo position, so towards the rest of the pi bonds. Nothing else is on the Duran side. So down and down. That one gets a little hard to see if you don't get your, your angles just right. <laughs> this front piece is all right. You almost have to exaggerate in order to get it done, but then it doesn't, it looks almost like it's exo. Yeah. You can see the five sided ring that better that way, but. And even when you, if you use a computer to draw this, you still, it still might not look that good when you draw these. It just. Okay, so even, even theirs um, still doesn't look all that neat, quite plain. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. Just try to make it, even if it's not pretty, so that somebody could um, reasonably interpret what you were trying to draw. All right, so questions on Niels Altler. Always the endo for the dienophile. And if you're not making a bicyclic structure, it doesn't matter. If you're not making a bicyclic structure, just pay attention to cis versus trans. All right, let's talk about electrocyclic reactions. So electrocyclic reactions happen so deals all the reactions, you start with three pi bonds and you turn them into one pi bond and two extra sigma bonds. Electrocyclic reactions, you lose one pi bond and make one sigma bond. Right, so similar transition state in a lot of ways. Um, typically this happens within the same molecule, but it doesn't have to necessarily. But the result of these electrons moving in this cyclic structure is that you wind up making one extra sigma bond and losing one pi bond. And then the next class, sigma tropic rearrangements, you don't lose any pi bonds or sigma bonds, you just rearrange what you have. You make a sigma bond here, but you make another pi bond on the other side. So there's no net change. Okay, so they're all similar but they look a little bit different. And so electrocyclic reactions happen when you have a conjugated polyene, it's not always a diene now, um, undergoes cyclization, which just means you make a cycle of it. Um, and it can be a diene, if you have conjugated dienes, one three butadiene has a, a 
electrocyclic reaction that looks like cyclobutene. We wouldn't expect that to be very stable, right? Because that's a lot of strain energy forcing these bonds to be uh, 100 in, or 90 degrees or even a little bit less in order to get that, that puckered shape. Now, that's really a deep pull back from before we even did cyclohexane. We talked about a puckered shape in order so that they didn't all wind up with their hydrogens in eclipse shapes in eclipse positions. So, under most circumstances, um, you're going to wind up with equilibrium favoring the cyclo product because sigma bonds in general are more stable than pi bonds, unless there's some strain energy, or sometimes you can have sterics actually preventing this from happening. So, especially if you had this, if you had um, two pieces of this attached to um, a larger ring structure, you can, you can see it being in a state where it can't turn into a cyclo group, like that um, that one we looked at earlier, or cyclobutadiene. That one can't form a cyclo group, right? Because sterics are in the other bonds keep it locked in this shape. So this gets really interesting when we start talking about um, these hexatrienes, because it turns out if we have this hexatriene that is substituted, when it goes through a ring closing reaction, electrocyclic reaction, we have two possibilities. So if we see that it starts out totally planar, but well, when we take these two carbons and turn them into tetrahedral carbons, well, all of a sudden we have cis versus trans to think about. And it turns out you can control whether you make the cis or the trans based on whether you catalyze this reaction with heat or light. So the fact that light is involved, what does that tell us about what might be happening? There's a couple of things we, we can guess might be options if light is involved. Up to this point, what do we think about when we see light in a reaction? Radicals, right? When radicals, light initiated those because what was it doing? Light initiates radical reactions by promoting electrons from bonding orbitals to antibonding orbitals. When you shine light on bromine or a peroxide or iodine or chlorine, if it's the right wavelength of light, you promote an electron. And now you have just as many electrons in antibonding orbitals as bonding orbitals, and the bonding or bond just disappears. Right, you cancel out the bond by putting one electron into an antibonding orbital. That's what's actually happening in those initiators in free radical reactions. Well, we don't have sigma antibonding orbitals necessarily that we're looking at here, but the fact that light changes something tells us that orbitals are probably involved. I mean, orbitals are always involved, but the orbitals are going to be running the show. We need to understand the orbitals if we're going to be able to wrap our heads around what's going on. Here. And so if we just use heat, we get one product. 
Don't worry too much about writing these down because I'm going to teach you the rules. It depends on how many pi bonds we have and what we're starting with, whether or not we wind up cis versus trans with our product. So the exact specifics don't matter here so much as the fact that the heat and light are controlling. All right, so we're going to use frontier orbitals to describe this. So if we start with 135 hexatriene, so basically that, that molecule we were just looking at minus the methyl groups, the orbitals, the homo for that system looks like this, where you have these, it looks like three pi bonds next to each other where you alternate each, each um, two orbitals, you hit a node. And what that looks like when you turn it into drawing a shape is you wind up with the, the highest occupied molecular orbital looks like this. Well, if we're going to break a pi bond and form a new sigma bond, we need these orbitals, these ones at the end, have to overlap to make a new sigma bond. And they have to overlap in the right phase. In other words, you need blue to overlap with blue or red to overlap with red. That means if we were taking this orbital, we would need to rotate the left-hand side clockwise. And the right-hand side would rotate counterclockwise. That would take these orbitals, rotate them in on top of each other so that they could have them overlapping with the same phase. What product would that give us for this molecule? Cis or trans? So we're starting like this, rotating the orbitals like this, which is going to drag these methyl groups with it. So if this side is rotating like that, that winds up that your final product has the methyl pointing up. And on this side, we're rotating like that, right? The methyl gets dragged with it. So we wind up with the methyl pointing up. So if it's the homo that's reacting in this case, we wind up with the cis product. Does any of you remember what we said when you go up in energy for these orbitals? What, what happens? What do the orbitals look like? What's the lowest energy orbital going to look like in this case for this pi system? What am I looking for? So if we have we have six pi orbitals to work with, or p orbitals to work with, right? The lowest energy state is the least number of nodes. What's the least number of nodes you could have? Zero. That's six. I'm standing so close to it. That is six. Okay. So the next lowest energy state would be, and I'm just going to write energy. So that's our lowest energy state. Next lowest energy state would be if there was one node, where would I draw that node? It's still going to be six orbitals. has to be symmetric on both sides. So you can't put nodes in in a way that's asymmetric. So if I have to put one node in, where does it have to go? Two, three, and four, right?
When you hit those notes, that just means you switch your side is shading. You switch phase when you hit those notes. All right, so what's the next highest one? How many notes is the next highest one going to have? Two notes. How can you put two nodes in so that it's symmetric? And there's really there's a couple of places you could do it that's symmetric if we're doing two. We want the one that still leaves us the most possible overlap. And what is the what is the next one going to look like? We keep going, right? We can all the way until we have five nodes where it alternates phase all the way, every single orbital alternates, right? That would be the highest energy. So if we have two nodes here. We could have three nodes. These ones are going to be a little bit smaller. If we're going to have three nodes, one has to go in the middle, and then one on either side of that, right? How many electron pairs do we have in this pi system? Just pi electrons. It's hexatriene. Yep. Three pairs, right? Six pi electrons. So when we're filling this up, our homo is going to be when we've used up. All six, right? That tells us that under normal conditions, this is our homo. Which is what the orbitals looked like on that last slide, right? When we looked at it and said, okay, well, we need the ones at the end to fold over and overlap with each other. They had the same phase pointing in the same direction, right? Red was down on both ends and blue was up on both ends, or shaded is down on both ends and unshaded is up on both ends. If that's our highest occupied orbital, that's the orbital where we need to form the overlap. Make a new signal bond. If we shine light on it, we bump an electron up, which means we added a node, which means we change the ends are no longer shaded down and unshaded up on both sides, right? By shining light on it, we make it from being shaded down on both sides to being shaded down here and shaded up on that side. Which means the way that we need to rotate these things to get them to overlap is reversed. This is why shining light on it changes which isomers you get. Right? And so and it's always going to come back to the frontier orbitals, the homo and the luma. So this took a long time and, and you know, at this point, probably would struggle trying to draw this yourself from a blank sheet of paper. If all 
always comes down to though, you make as many P orbitals as you have atoms in the system, carbons in the system, and then you start adding nodes. And so it doesn't matter that it's six. It could this works if it's only four p orbitals as well, right? Or it works if there's eight p orbitals. All that matters is you have to know when you hit that homo and what the lumbo looks like. You know what those two look like, then you're going to be able to predict this. All right, so a lot of times what we'll show, all we really care about are the orbitals at the very end, right? And the number of nodes just depends on, or the, what's at the end depends on how many nodes you have, right? Because every time you hit a node, you flip up and down, right, or red and blue. So a lot of times we just represent the rest of the system with this, just a ring structure. Like, okay, well, there's something linking these two sides. It's a bunch of P orbitals. It doesn't really matter. All that matters There we go. That. Is this side and this side heating up with each other. All right, so in this case, we wind up needing them to rotate what's called disrotatory. It's going to look weird. It's going to sometimes you have to, to think about this because it seems obvious to us if you use your thumbs for these orbitals, you're rotating them towards each other no matter what, right? But the fact that one goes clockwise and one goes counterclockwise is what makes it disrotatory. If they need to rotate the same direction to get the orbitals to overlap, so if you have, have them sitting like this, you wind up with them both, it feels backwards to say, but they're actually rotating the same direction. That would be conrotatory. Right, and so they drew it, they drew the red ones rotating to overlap with each other, but it doesn't really matter. You're going to get the cis product either way, as long as it's the same color overlapping with each other. So with light catalyzed, when we promote the electron to the LUMO, the LUMO looks like this. We added an extra node, which means we flipped up or down one extra time, right? So one way to think about this is every time you add a node, even if you don't draw your nodes in the right spot, it doesn't really matter as long as you flipped up and down the right number of times, right? So for the homo, there's two nodes. General rule of thumb is unless you've got a charge or you're unless you're missing electrons, um, you're gonna have, your homo is gonna have one fewer node than the number of pi bonds. Right, and so then it, it doesn't really matter where you draw the nodes. You just have to know, okay, if I've got three pi bonds, the homo has two nodes, which means I hit one node, I flip. And I hit the other node, I flip back. In other words, if there's two nodes, pieces at the end have the same phase, have their phase shift pointed the same direction. If there's three nodes, that means you flip up and down three times. So up goes to down for the first node, down goes to up for the second node, up goes back to down for the third node. So if there's three nodes, you wind up with these things, the opposite ends being flipped. And so that's what the LUMO looks like. Three nodes means it's flipped up and down three times. 
So the ones that are at the end are opposite face to each other. Which means to get them both to rotate properly, to get the red to overlap with the red, they both have to be rotating clockwise, or both have to be rotating counterclockwise, which gives you, in this case, the trans product. And so it, it depends a little bit on what you start with. Do we start with these metals pointed? Are they pointed in opposite directions, or do they start pointing in the same direction? And it depends on how big your Pi system is. But it's always going to come back to that. What is the shape of these orbitals? And that's what's known as the Woodward Hoffman rules. So, Woodward and Hoffman, um, each independently won Nobel Prizes, not for the Woodward. I think Woodward won this for the Woodward Hoffman rules. Hoffman's was for something else. Um, actually, Hoffman's was in 1981, so it was shared with Fukui, who came up with Fermi orbitals. So Woodward won his earlier for something else. Robert, I think. Um, and this is the other Hoffman. And I put two F's and two N's, but I'm pretty sure it's about one of them. It's the opposite spelling from the Hoffman from Hoffman product from um, addition or elimination reactions. I think that one was one F and two N's. So I'm pretty sure this one is two F's and one N. Woodward's Not the same guy. Woodward teaches as well. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a really cool guy. And that Hoffman is one, he has actually a published book of poetry um, as well. He's actually a, a pretty good writer. He was trying to be for chemistry what Carl Sagan was for, for uh, astronomy. He was never quite as successful. He wasn't as talented in that, in his use of words, but he's still a very, very bright guy. And his writing is very interesting to read. Um, so these are the ways that the Woodward Hoffman rules are presented. I think that this, this is over, overly limiting in terms of it only looks at four versus four pi electrons versus six pi electrons, and it takes it all the way to con rotatory and dis rotatory. Whereas I think it's more helpful to actually think about the orbitals. So for instance, if we were trying to look at this molecule, this reaction, when exposed to light, so If I'm trying to solve this, take this and you say, okay, I've got three pi bonds, which means my homo has two nodes. And Six pi electrons implies three pi bonds. Therefore, homo equals two nodes. And if the homo has Two nodes, what does that tell us about the lumo? It's got to have one more node, right? The so lumo is three nodes. Light goes with the lumo, 
Keep goes with the home wall. It's the easiest way to remember it. Just straight up use the, the alliteration there. So three nodes means that when we have this system, we, we're starting with this system where you got phenyl group. There's our P, P orbital and the way that it starts with both of the phenyl groups pointed outward. This is what we're looking at. Right, and so this is all just to set it up. If we have three nodes, we flip up and down three times, right? So take one side, shade in one of those, and say, okay, shade it is up. And then I get three nodes. First node, shade it goes down. Second node, shaded is back to up. Third node, shaded is down. Now what I know, now I know, it doesn't matter what the rest of the orbitals look like, really. It just matters that there's three nodes for the system we're looking at. And now we can say, all right, I need the shaded parts to overlap with each other. To get the two shaded parts to overlap with each other, we have to rotate them both clockwise or both counterclockwise. Either way, it's con rotatory to use that term. And that means our product is going to be cis or trans? Trans. Right? So the Woodward Hoffman rules is a neat little table, but at the same time, it's really hard. You either have to memorize it or you go through this every time. I find it easier. I, I hate being able to memorize things just on general principle. I wind up memorizing them half the time anyway, but I don't like having to memorize things. So for me, going through this every time is more reliable than memorizing the, that table that says con rotatory versus this rotatory. Because this process works no matter how many pi electrons you have. No matter what's going on, you can always take this approach. If you have something weird going on, like you're missing an electron or you have an extra electron that changes homo and lumo, so charges throw this all off. This step right here, if you have an extra electron, all of a sudden your homo is what we were calling the lumo because you have electrons in a higher energy level than normal. And that means that gets thrown off, but Woodward Hoffman rules get thrown off by that anyway. And it'd be pretty unlikely, pretty unusual to see that. And so our final answer for this question So one of these pi bonds turns into the sigma bond, closes this off. The other ones stay as pi bonds, they just move over. And we wind up with the trans product plus EN, just technically, because we made something that has two stereo centers. We make the cis product, then it's meso. So that's really abstract and tricky to follow a little bit. We get more comfortable with it. We'll keep practicing with it, but it always is going to come down to the same things. What's my homo? What's my lumo? Am I using heat? Am I using light? And then can you draw it to show the rotation happening the right way? And there's plenty of, pro of practice there. Today's Thursday, right? So we'll do some fields, all the reactions, and a couple of these for the quiz this week. Right? If I'm thinking about that right first, I 